What's up, Mentors Collective? I'm going to share something that I haven't shared with anyone yet, not on my Instagram, not on the podcast. And I've been waiting to share this until it was pretty much a sure thing, if not already done. But we just closed on our first commercial real estate property, a little over $3 million right in the heart of downtown St. Pete for our team. Uh, we'll be occupying the entire 9,000 square feet. We're super excited about it. But let me tell you, the process that we went through to get this building was a total nightmare. We had almost no guidance. We got denied from almost every bank that we asked. And if I would have known what I'm about to learn in this, this, this conversation, this podcast episode, through conversations with a real expert and a real mentor, which is what this show is really for, we could have bypassed a whole lot of pain and suffering. Uh, so if you're listening to this and you're a business owner and you want to start buying commercial real estate, you wanna build an empire, of commercial real estate. This episode is going to be teach you how to do it so you don't make a lot of the same mistakes we did and how to actually get started on your journey with very little money. So without further ado, I wanna introduce the expert on the topic, friend Ben Reinberg, who started building his real estate empire at 24 years old and now owns over $500 million in commercial real estate. I am super pumped to chop it up with you, Ben, and learn from you who i now consider a mentor commercial real estate welcome brother thanks jay i appreciate it uh look forward to adding a lot of value to you and your audience and uh hopefully everyone gains a lot of knowledge and they walk away saying man i i feel like i could start investing in commercial real estate so let's get right at it right and even if you don't think you're gonna ever buy commercial real estate it's still important to know this stuff because you really never know uh, and, and the, I mean, with the, what hap what's happening in the economy, sometimes it just makes sense and it could be a massive opportunity as I'm sure we're going to learn. So you started building your empire at 24 years old. That's pretty wild. Did you have a big upfront investment to buy your first building? How did you afford your first building? How I afford my first building is when I was younger, I had to go out and get a loan, which was challenging for me. So I went to a local bank, got a loan. Uh, put together a package and I syndicated my first deal. And I just put my mindset was I can do it. I have confidence, even though I didn't know what I was doing. I was young, didn't understand business. Uh, it wasn't like today with the internet, with how much knowledge is out there, whether it's accurate or not. There's still people that feel that know how to do certain things in business and can teach you. And at the time when I was getting started, it was what I call shoe leather. We all, when we were younger, we used to wear leather shoes that laced up and suits. And every, for probably 15, 20 years of my career, I wore a three piece suit with a handkerchief and I was rocking. Now I'm a little bit different. Now that I live in California, I'm a t shirt, jeans kind of guy. Look at us uh, now. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so I'm a little bit different in, in my dress. However, uh, the experience uh, continues to grow over time. And what I did was when I was younger, I syndicated and I went out and I asked people and I just said, I have to get this done. And I put pressure on myself. So my first equity raise was a few million dollars. It was a lot of money when I was 24 back in the early nineties. And I got a loan and I closed and, uh, and it was an interesting deal. It was a deal. It was an industrial deal where I'm from. I was born and raised in Chicago. That's where my headquarters currently is. I sit in our West Coast office in Newport Beach. And then we have an office in your backyard in Tampa as well. So with that in mind, what I learned from that deal is I learned how to deal with challenges, how to manage a lender, how to manage and property manage a property, how to bring in the right resources. And so I learned, and that was a stepping stone. Once I did that deal and I was over, I was able to overcome challenges, Jay, uh, I sold it for a great prof for profit. Uh, there's a lot of probably multifamily people out there in the ether that listen to you. It was a 3X multiple. For me, I look at IRRs. It was a tremendous return to our investors. And that's what launched me. It was about a three to four hour process, three or four, excuse me, three or four year process, that investment. But what's interesting about it is I decided I wanted to sell the deal. I wanted to be the listing broker because I wanted to learn what that really looked like. And what I learned when I sold it was if you let your buyers know the train's coming. So, for example, in that industrial property, 
we needed a new roof. So we went out and we bid it. It was about $250,000, Jay. And we underwrote that. We used to use a model called Argus back in the day. It was basically an averaging cash flow program, really sophisticated. I'm also a CPA, so I'm really good at underwriting deals. And back in the day when I was 24, I had to do everything. Now I have different departments where I don't do a lot of that work. I just kind of oversee it and see what goes on. And we have a leadership team that has 200 plus years in my company. And so we're a lot different than when I was 24 years old. Right. But when I was 24, all these lessons carry forward to me today. And I never forget about the lessons it taught me. I never forget about my first deal. Uh, it still resonates me. What resonates with me when I do other deals as well. So that's how I got started. And long story short, I've built over 10 million square feet of office and industrial in my career. We bought and sold hundreds uh, and hundreds of commercial real estate properties that we own and manage. And today uh, we currently own and manage office, industrial and retail all throughout the United States. And we just launched a new fund about 17 years ago, Jay. We got involved in medical properties. So we just launched a new medical office fund where the fund will not only invest in medical properties, but also veterinary properties. Very cool. And so I'm just really proud of my staff, my company, and where we've come. Uh, it's been quite the grind. It's a marathon business commercial real estate. Don't let anyone tell you differently. You did one deal and you thought it was challenging. And you I barely even did it. My my yeah. co-founder, my my uh, technically the CEO of our company, who likes to deal with all the the documents and the legal and filling out all the paperwork, I barely dealt with like I, I dealt with the minimal amount, and it was still horrible. So I can only imagine. Well, I've I've done every sec section of our process, mm -hmm. whether and it be it, raising equity, procuring debt, uh, negotiating uh, letters of intent, purchase and sale agreements, dealing with environmental engineers, regular property condition assessment engineers, lenders all over the country, uh, property management, you name it. One thing I learned when I was younger is I wanted to know every sector of the business so I could teach it, right. which I'm an expert in. And so a lot of people label me as like a seven tool player. And that's what you have to be when you're young. You really got to get into the weeds and understand every aspect of commercial real estate. Why? Because then you end up learning how to manage risk. And managing risk in our business is everything. How do you deal with tenants? How do you understand the credit worthiness of tenants? How do you solve challenges? How do you deal with the actual real estate when you have challenges? You know, look at your area, okay? We have properties in Cape, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, uh, St. Petersburg, the Tampa area, MSA, Orlando, all throughout Florida. And if you look at the last hurricane we just went through, well, we're in the process of redoing some of the roofs. We've had signage get ripped out of the ground, concrete monument signage. How do you deal with those issues? How are your leases written? So you really have to become an expert and you have to also develop into what I call resource rich. Having the resources to help you to be able to take an investment property like we do from A to Z, from start to finish. And a lot of that stems from your networking, your resources, how do you find them? how you develop good resources, how do you do due diligence properly, which is really important in our business. So there's a lot of facets to it. And what I love about what I do is it creates a high barrier to entry. It's very rare that someone at a young age, like I did at 24, could just walk into our business. They might oh, yeah. walk in like I did, but it's taken me over 28 years to get to this point where I become uh, an icon and an expert in our business. And that's what it is. It's a marathon business. And it's funny. I was talking to my business partner about this. Like we know tons of people who own residential real estate. You were 24. I don't even know anybody our age and I'm about to th turn 31 that owns commercial real estate, even in their own office. And I thought that was a, an interesting thing. And then I looked at the process that we went through to actually get this building. And I see why the barrier to entry is so high. I see why no, not a lot of people go through the pain and the learning curve that, that you need to go through to understand this stuff. Now, you said a couple of things, um, and I can tell you're really passionate about this, that I thought were really interesting and could be helpful. Uh, the last one, and we'll, we'll start there, is that you learned every sector of this business at an early age. And it sounds like you went through formal CPA training, not easy. You were the listing agent, so you must have gotten, did you get your real estate license? 
Is that? Yeah, I mean, in Illinois, to have a property management company, I had to be licensed. Very and cool. So at the time when I was younger, uh, we had a brokerage division where we would broker our properties, need be if we had to. And we would also, uh, we did a lot of project management projects, which you had to be licensed. So I did, I got my broker's license, my managing broker's license. Eventually the laws changed as I aged. And back then there was no technology. So due diligence was a lot different than it is today. Uh, yeah. Raising equity was different back then. But what was great about the past was relationships really were prevalent to get stuff done like they are today. The difference was I'd actually go see someone and have a real conversation in their conference room. Now we do Zoom calls. Now it's a lot different with technology. Right, and when the playing field and access to information is level, then competition tends to increase too, I imagine. Yeah, comp yeah but the difference is there's still a barrier to entry to do what we do. Because right. if you can't close, it's hard to get deals uh, funneled your way from yeah. the brokerage community. You need a track record. Building right. a track record is really prevalent. And that was something that was a challenge when I first started raising equity. But the deal was so great. I knew that the returns were good. The preferred return was good. The back end, I gave away most of the store when I was younger. Now it's a lot different structure for me. But at the end of the day, Jay, that's what I had to do to get a deal done. And then after I did a handful of deals and my track record started to improve, well, I, I added more value to the yeah. investment community. I have credibility value, and trust. Yeah. Yeah. Once you add value, you know, I have a saying, what we sell our investments is called the Birkin bag. It's rare, it's exclusive, and it has a tremendous amount of value. And that's what we sell when we're raising equity. It's a total different mantra. It's a different mindset. We're raising equity from high net worth of credit investors and family offices and institutions. But at the end of the day, you have to get started. And so for your audience, whether it's any facet in real estate, you're flipping houses, you're rehabbing, which is sexy because HGTV and all these different TV shows have all these young couples doing it and it looks appealing and easy, uh, still work. Commercial yeah. real estate, a little bit more sophisticated. It's based off numbers, financial analysis, understanding real estate fundamentals, understanding the market you're in, your tenants, your credit worthiness. There's a lot of variables that we underwrite that can impact uh, commercial real estate. What I love about what we do, Jay, in the medical office space is that the human body is never going out of style. And what I mean by that is our tenants foundation is the human body. You and your entire family have to go to the doctor in some form or shape or form. So, you know, as you get older, you'll go and get a colonoscopy, heart, uh, orthopedic, because more people are working out and exercise are big, you know, surgery centers. So we do all these different niches, dialysis. Don't I mean, be so sure. <laughs> it's funny. Okay. I, I, I come from a medical background. There's so many cool advances coming in specifically like colonoscopies, yeah. like getting an um, MR, yeah. MRI in your colon. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's amazing. It's evolving quickly, but you're right. I mean, medicine's not going anywhere. They're probably the best tenants. I'm sure you've never had to evict a clinic or a doctor's office from your commercial space or have them fall out. You're you're susceptible to less issues right. than a general office tenant. So, for example, a lot of our tenants invest significantly in their properties. They have a purpose in the community. A lot of them have been in business for quite some time. So they pay their bills. You look at their financial statements. You can see how successful they are. That's part of our underwriting and due diligence process. So what we call our real estate is pandemic and recession resilient real estate. During the pandemic, Jay, we were able to collect all our rents. And we're one of the few companies in the country that say that. So that makes it appealing. What we do is safe, secure, and profitable investments. That's what medical office is. And that's what we hang our shingle on. And it's something where that creates also a high barrier to entry because you really have to understand how each different niche in the medical office space operates. You know, they it, all have different requirements, different licensing. Every state's different. So we have a very specific criteria. We invest in the South and the Southeast and the Southwest, uh, Mountain West and certain parts of the West Coast. And we do that for a reason. You have to remember, I'm from the Midwest. We still own property in the Midwest. But we realized a lot at, at, at in a real short period of time that taxes were increasing, people were moving out of the area, 
they wanted to be more south. And so we looked at and said, well, where can we invest? So, you know, Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Kansas, you know, Utah, Nevada, all these different states have great value enhancement that they provide to our investors. And so that's why we invest in there. Great population growth, great healthcare markets. And so it's the ability for us to add a lot of value to the investment community along with our expertise. I'd love to dig into the strategy a little bit more with the medical offices, because obviously it makes a lot of sense. I guess the question is, did you try other things or did you start off investing in medical offices? How did you come to take on that as your what you hang your hat on? I started in industrial in office. Mm -hmm. I really like industrial. I still own industrial around the country. Uh, I built it. I get it. Being from Chicago, Chicago is what I call a 24-hour city where there's three shifts. So industrial is one of the top. It's a port city. It's one of the top industrial markets in the country. And that's how I cut my teeth with industrial and general office. Do you give an example and, of what industrial means? Well, industrial has different segments. Okay. So industrial could be a manufacturing building. Okay. Uh, industrial could be distributions where mm. maybe you have certain clear heights of your ceilings. All industrial buildings have different docks. You could have drive in doors. You could have compressed docks. There's different, different ceiling heights, the way it lays out. Uh, where's it located? And so there's also flex. Flex is where it's industrial and office where you can manipulate the amount of office in your industrial building. So there's different types of industrial and you have to understand it and you have to understand where it sits because if it's distribution, where do you sit near the major expressways? Now that I'm in California, they call them freeways. So where are you in conjunction to what I call the arteries that uh, where the flow of distribution is. So if you have a distribution building and you're sandwiched between a couple expressways, you know, it might be a great location. So a lot of variables you got to assess. That's, uh, that is industrial. Office could be anywhere from single story to multi-story office buildings. There's different types. There's class A, there's class B, there's class C. There's what we call core. Core is like a class A office building that institutions are going to own, like a skyscraper, like say in Chicago, that, you know, uh, now I think it's called the Willis Tower. Um, I'm not sure what's named anymore. It used to be a Sear, the Sears Tower when I was a kid. So I was looking at the Sears Tower. Uh, and then, you know, in New York, you could look at all the different buildings in Manhattan. And those are core. There's core plus where you get value. There's value add. And then there's different segments, too, where you could have medical office. That is, you could have data centers, which is part of office. Data centers can also be part of industrial, too. So there's a few products that blend into both. So and, interesting. And then you have retail. And so I'm an expert in retail. We own shopping centers, single tenant net lease uh, buildings we've owned in the past, restaurants, uh, single tenant assets like Family Dollar, Dollar General, uh, you know, Ethan Allen stores, you name it, we've owned in the past or we've built uh, in, and sold. So uh, those are my expertise. And the reason why we love medical office is because it's stable product, produces great cash flow, and it allows us to sell into a large audience where we end up selling our assets. So the strategy with, you know, filling it with medical um, clinics and doctors makes a lot of sense. Are you typically buying buildings that are already uh, constructed from somebody else? Or are you typically building new commercial real estate from scratch? Well, we built commercial real estate from scratch when I was a lot younger. And then mm -hmm. we started buying existing assets. So we can do both. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, right now, we buy existing assets that have tenants in them that we fill our fund in. Our fund is all about producing cash flow with upside. Cool. And so that's a lot of our focus. So we buy anywhere from single tenant net lease medical buildings all the way up to, say, eight or nine tenants in a building. But everything's net lease. We only buy buildings with net leases. And remind me again, what is net lease? What does that mean for those? So a, it's a great question. A net lease is where the tenant has to pay for all the CAM, insurance, and taxes. Now, a net lease has different levels to it. So, for example, 
Some leases might be what we call absolute net lease, where the tenant pays for everything directly and they're responsible for all the different expenses, including taxes and insurance. They'll pay all that directly. There's other net leases where uh, we'll create a budget. They'll pay us additional rent, which is CAM insurance taxes. And then we do a reconciliation at the end of the year and either credit them or they owe us money at the end of the year. The other thing is there's also net leases where like an absolute net lease, we might create where the tenant's responsible for all the capital improvements to the property, the roof, the structure, the parking lot, uh, you know, uh, windows, you name it, they're responsible for those capital improvements. There's other leases out there where on the landlord, which is off the position we sit in, Jay, is that we might be responsible for the roof or we might be responsible for repair and maintenance of something, the roof, maybe the parking lot, maybe the HVAC, we're responsible for rep replacement, maybe not maintenance or repair. So every lease is written differently. Right. But at the end of the day, you're charging your tenant a base rent, which is your net rent. And either they're going to pay the expenses directly or they're going to reimburse you and then you're going to pay them out. And when it comes to certain repairs and maintenance and replacement items, that's all negotiable that you see in these leases. And that that and so what that ends up uh, factoring into our decision process, Jay, is how do we underwrite that? Right. So, for example, an absolute net lease where the tenant's responsible for everything it's a little bit easier because the tenant's responsible. You look at the credit worthiness of the tenant. However, if it's a net lease where we have certain responsibilities, I have to look at what is the actual use of life of that particular item? How am I going to underwrite that in my model? Let's say I'm projecting out cash flows for 10 years. Am I replacing it in year five? So then I'll present value that back and say, okay, what does that really mean for the purchase price? And do I have to replace it? Is it in new condition? Do I have warranties? There's so many variables you have to underwrite. Go back to my statement that there's high barriers to entry. Well, it takes years to really understand how these right. variables work and how they incorporate into mitigating risk. I am an expert at mitigating risk. You could smell it when you could see it. And that's the point you get to. It's really, you know, this business becomes more of like an osmosis. You really yeah. start, you learn it, and then all of a sudden it becomes in your blood ingrained in you, and you can just see where the challenges are and how do you deal with it. It's one thing I'm very proud about Alliance, my company, is that one thing we're outstanding at is solving challenges. And this business is an experienced person's game, and you have to understand how to solve challenges, and you have to have the right people around you to solve challenges. So with 200 plus years of leadership team at Alliance, it's a tremendous asset. You don't really think about it, but you're you're grateful for it because what that allows you to do is you could be nimble and you could also have the ability to solve challenges when they arise. And that's the key to real estate. Those are the people I invest in. That's why a lot of people are interested in investing in our new fund and investing with Alliance because we understand how to deal with these challenges. We understand when they arise. We, we've been through recessions. So we understand what the opportunities are. I'm very excited about this upcoming market because there's gonna be tremendous buying opportunities for us. Yes. And yes. these are the moments. Someone said this the other day, and I agree with them. He basically took the words out of my mouth. These are the moments that you build wealth. These are the moments where you have great opportunities that you won't have for a while. We go through different cycles throughout our country. And these are the best times. These are the times where you roll up your sleeves and you think you're working eight hours, you work 12 hours that day. And you do it because you don't see these markets come around too often. You see it because people make decisions in our lives that create environments like that's forthcoming and it's that we're already starting to be in. So I'm extremely excited, Jay, about this market. I'm looking to take advantage of it. And uh, I use this term, I'm gonna go hog wild because hog wild. I am, so excited to have opportunities where, you know, and our business is fairly conservative with medical mm -hmm. office buildings. So the fact that I might buy on a cap rate 200 to 250, 300 basis points compared to where I was the last handful of years, that's a tremendous opportunity for us. And I believe to... interest rates will eventually come around. They'll lower a little bit. They'll stay steady. I've seen this before where rates are in six, seven, and eight on a face rate. 
and the cost of capital is higher, and then we have a shift, and then rates drop a little bit. I don't think it's going to be back where we're going to be in the teens on a face rate. I don't, I think we're tempering it in the right manner. I think we're kind of controlling it right now. So I believe in my personal opinion that interest rates are going to be there. They're going to be rising a little bit. Cap rates are going to rise. People are going to have trouble refinancing their properties. It's going to allow people like us that are well capitalized and resource rich, the ability to buy properties at a great price. And Jay, what that's going to end up happening is it's going to allow us to get great opportunities. That way, when things starts turning, okay, we'll have the ability to sell at great profits. The key of the business, Jay, is the ability to hold. And this market is the quintessential example of what I mean by that. You're going to head, head into a recession. My opinion is going to be a shallow one. However, with that in mind, you'll have the ability, if you can hold your properties and ride through this cycle, we come out of it, you have the ability to add a tremendous amount of value. And my investors know that. We educate them on what's going on. We educate them on our opinions. We educate them why we create this fund in this market. And I'm very confident and very comfortable saying I'm really excited about what we're going to do for our investors in this marketplace. And so it's a good uh, point. I'd love to talk for a second about what to do in this market, specifically if you're relying on taking on a mortgage from a bank or, 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 or something else. And this was a problem that we were kind of battling uh, internally. Is this the right time? We are facing uh, mortgage rates. Granted, we got in at a, at, a, at a pretty good rate compared to where they are now and where they're going. But is it the right time to buy? Even though you're going to be able to save a couple bucks, if you're paying an 8% face rate, I mean, that is going to be a massive suck on your mortgage. So what are, what are you looking at? What would you recommend for people wanting to get into commercial real estate or thinking about it right now? Should they wait for interest rates to come down? Or is it a good idea to buy now? Maybe you get a decent deal. You pay the high mortgage rates and then refinance when they finally do come down in five, 10 years from now. God knows when. Well, let's take a step back for a second because I think this is really important. Yeah. Putting aside commercial real estate, what you should be doing. One you should look at cutting out some of the fat that you have going on in your life. You yes. know, tighten your belt in this market. You know, don't spend stuff on lavish things. Watch your budget, okay? That would be something I would advise. Keep your powder dry, keep cash, okay? And because there's gonna be buying opportunities you've never seen. So in this market, what I would advise everyone in your audience is to keep cash, raise money if you can, and prepare yourself for these buying opportunities that are forthcoming. These are the markets when everyone's tightening up and doesn't want to do anything. You, you, you put your foot on the gas with your marketing. You put your foot on the gas with your acquisitions. You go the other way. I like to do things opposite than the public. You know, People might think I'm crazy for that, but that's how I've created mass wealth and success is that when someone's going this way, I'm looking the other way. And this market is no different. I think this market is, you know, when people don't want to market because they're going to tighten their belt or they have layoffs or they're kind of, you know, tightening up their purse strings not to invest, it's the time you want to invest. These are great markets to invest in. Uh, it's great opportunities that are forthcoming and even existing. And our business lags about six to eight months past the stock market. So the bid to the ask which is the sales price that a seller wants to what I'm willing to pay. There's a pretty big gap right now, but you're going to see over the next few quarters, probably next two to four quarters, that's going to start shrinking and there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And unfortunately, uh, my heart goes out for these people at these larger companies, there's going to be layoffs and there's going to be people that are going to have to rent and not going to be able to afford their home or, they're over leveraged. And so we've been through different recessions and we've seen it. So my advice to everyone is tighten your belt, okay? Look at what you're spending on on a daily basis. Figure out how to tighten your belt, figure out how to conserve cash because you're not gonna see buying like opportunities like this for a while. And these are the times you wanna take advantage. So uh, that's how I would approach the market. Um, that's my lens, my opinion, my viewpoint, but I've been pretty good 
at predicting markets and seeing what happens and it's create success. So that's what I would do. I would I would look at how to accumulate as much cash as possible so I could move towards uh, opportunities. It doesn't have to be commercial real estate, Jay. That could be anything. If people are buying companies, people are in residential, they're rehabbing houses or fixing and flipping. Um, you just don't know. I'm a conservative guy. I like to uh, conserve cash. And um, I believe in what I do. I'm, I'm a huge proponent investor in what we do. It's because I love it. And I, it's, hard, it's hard to find an investment with the tax benefits that we get right. in commercial real estate. That's the main and reason so, we did it. And, and, you know, God bless our forefathers in this country. They set up great tax laws mm -hmm. and they carry through today. And it's really an advantage. You, there's no other investment vehicle in the world than real estate, especially commercial real estate, where you can get great tax benefits. And one of the ones that we took advantage of, and here's a little bonus nugget for anyone listening. Uh, if you have a company that does have a bunch of cash and you're looking at a, a six figure tax bill at the end of the year, uh, this commercial building that we just got, we're doing a cost segmentation analysis where they come in and they segment basically the depreciating years on the different elements of the building. And anything that's going to depreciate over five years, you can write off in the first year in a bonus depreciation. So we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars this first year just through that tax saving strategy. And that's just one. I'm sure there's others, but that's one of the factors that led us to, to pull the trigger on this, even with high interest rates. Uh, so, Ben, I guess to, to kind of follow up on that question, are you buying real estate right now with, with the mortgage rates high? Uh, would you buy real estate if the prices come down a little bit? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, we're buying real estate right now. Uh, again, it's all about the ability to hold. If right. I'm financing something in the upper fives or low sixes on an interest rate and I get 25 year amortization, but my purchase price is commiserate to my cost of capital and my numbers pencil out, then yeah, absolutely. It's all based on real estate fundamentals for us. We're going to look at the rent, uh, um, the market rent within the area. We're going to look at vacancy rates. We're going to look at absorption rates. We're going to look at the type of construction, the credit worthiness of the tenant or tenants in our building. And that will all factor into how we underwrite and how we're going to pay for it. As long as what we're comfortable in managing risk, for us, it's just economics. You know, when interest rates rise, cap rates rise as well. And prices start to drop. And even though there's a little bit of lag going on, that will change shortly. And so right now we're positioning ourselves where we can buy as much as possible when that change does happen. But in the meantime, if we find great real estate and that meets the criteria of our fund, we're gonna go after it. We think there are opportunities. We think opportunities are starting to come around. So uh, yeah, we're, we are definitely buying in this market. And what's gonna happen to rent over the next five years? You know, As prices start to come down and mortgage rates stay really high, maybe even go higher, uh, are you able to charge more rent and do you expect that companies are gonna to have to pay more rent for, for renting? Well, it's a unique market we're in. We got, a, we got some interesting variables going on. I'll give you an example. Inflation is, is extremely high. Uh, it's a lot higher than the government's reporting. And we see our CPI indexes are significantly higher than they've ever been around the country. Mm -hmm. And our consumer price index, if no one knows what that is. And what that means for us is there is an upward pressure on rents. But if we get into a recession, what that will do is that will pull a compression of rents. So it's interesting. We have inflation going on that's putting an upward pressure on rents. But then if we have a recession, it's going to compress rents as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But with interest rates rising, what's going to end up happening is you're probably going to have uh, some lower rental rates that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have vacancy. So in our underwriting, we look at where's the rent compared to market. And hopefully at most of our properties, our rents are below market, so we're insulated. So if we do have a vacancy, we can make sure we go out to the market. We might be able to get more rent than we originally underrated or our current income stream that was in the lease that we had. So it's a little bit different. It's, a, it's an interesting time we're dealing with because we have these variables that are pulling forces two different directions. You have inflation, but you also have a looming recession that we believe is already existing. We think we'll get a little bit deeper over time. And that will put some downward pressure on rents where for the last 24 months, we've had some upward pressure on rents going on.
Interesting times indeed all around. It's been a crazy, and this is my first uh, participant in any crash like this, any recession like this. So it's been very interesting for me to kind of follow it. I'm sure a lot of the listeners as well. So it's great to hear your perspective on this uh, and we'll see how, how this all develops. I'd love to spend a couple of minutes talking about your first deal, uh, asking a couple nuances of it because as a 24 year old kid going in and getting funding for a commercial real estate building is still, still baffles me. It's, it's pretty crazy. And I know the first one's gotta be the hardest for, for everybody, right? You have no track record. You have no reason for people to give you money and trust you. So I guess let's start there. As a 24 year old kid, why do you think you were able to, to get the funding? Why did people give you money? <laughs> uh, well, I was, uh, I was good at financial analysis. And I think the key, Jay, was I put an outstanding package together. I realized at a young age, if I could put a package together that stands on its own, and I preach that in my company all day long for everything we do, emails, documents, statements, you name it. You need the ability to put together a package where if I laid it on a table and I didn't know you and Jay Feldman picked it up, you know exactly what that document was, what the returns were, what was the risk, what was the market. So I put together a great package and I threw on the suit and went to go meet with people and I was paying a great return. It was a great deal. And just once I got my first, say, half a million raised, it was social proof. OK, that word didn't exist back then, so I could use it now, which I learned. It was social proof that this was a good investment and that people trusted me with their money. So guess what? Someone says, wait a minute. An 8% preferred return, you're giving me 80% of the equity. Yeah, I'll throw 50 grand in, 100 grand in. And that was it. And then, and then all of a sudden I was at a million, that was a million and a half. And I raised the money in a few weeks. I mean, that's how, but there were some keys to it, okay? It was persistent. It was nonstop raising equity. It was always on my mind. Weekends, nights, phone calls, networking, throwing on the suit every day. OK, going to someone's conference room that was maybe, you know, 30, 40 years older than me at the time to have a conversation where they would, could run laps around me. And uh, and I had to do a lot of battles. I had a, my own mental battle because I had to deal with my mind saying, can I do this? Right. Or how do I communicate with uh, an investor that has millions of dollars in their bank account? And why are they going to believe in me to diversify more some of their capital and, de and deploy it with me instead of investing in someone else? There was other sponsors in Chicago. There's all different types of investment, multifamily. Residential development was going wild back then. And so there was a lot of opportunities. It'll make a lot of money. So the fact that I was able to raise money with this asset as my first deal is really, really a, a neat story for me that I could look back and, and, and resonate with. It is what, confidence it, and it, persistence can go a long, well, long way. The thing about this story is that the first week we owned it, we lost 45% of the rental income. We had, a, we had a tenant move out in the middle of the night. Jesus. So it was a two tenant building. I backfilled it, made a three tenant building and we sold it for an incredible return. And that was my first deal. And that deal, like I said earlier, had so many lessons to it that I carry through today, all the lessons I've learned from it. And it's really benefited me. And so I don't believe in the word can't. I didn't believe when I was 24 years old. Um, I think my advantage was I didn't come from money. I had to make and create my own wealth. Uh, and I think that, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder when I was younger. I wanted to show people that I could do it. You know, when I was out there raising equity, I wasn't going to stop. And he's not, even if I got, as I got older and I used to handle raising equity in my company, I always had that ability like, like, okay, today I'm going to go raise $5 million and I would go do it. Say I'm going to go raise 8 million or 10 or three or whatever. I would go in on a Saturday, Jay, and I would sit in my office and I'd keep the lights off and I would be pounding the phones and sending out texts and emails and, whatever technology I could use at the time. And I did that because I always remembered the first deal, this deal I mentioned, what it took to raise equity. 
and that carried forward to me throughout my career. I don't take things for granted. I, I appreciate, you know, the processes that have gone into play to get to this point in my life. And that's what you have to do. You have to be persistent. You have to believe in yourself. You can't give up. You got to show up every day. Some days are better than others. You know, I look at it like I'm into physical fitness. Okay. I train with a trainer five days a week here in California. And I did in Chicago too with my trainer there. It's the same mentality. You have to show up. You have to do the work. You have to be present. You have to be focused. You have to uh, network, develop relationships. You have to build your reputation and your track record. It all starts in the foundation. It's all just hard work and persistence and focus. And I think a lot of people lose fact that they say, well, I only want the four hour work week. I don't believe, I just, I don't know how you, how that works, especially in our business. Our business is, you know, we have so many Zoom calls now and variables and property management and right. everything. I don't know how you can work a couple hours a day. It just, it doesn't resonate with me. And because of that, the other thing that I benefit compared to the other generation is that when I learned the business, there was no texting. There was no email wasn't really prevalent. Got to pick up the phone every time you want to talk I, to someone. I use yeah. a fax machine or, or I use FedEx I, or, you know, I use the phone. I used to pay thousands and thousands of di uh, dollars in phone bills because we had inner and intra type phone bills. And so the phone was everything. Going in person to meeting someone was everything. And so what did that teach me? That taught me how to deal with people, how to communicate, how to give, how to network, how to build a relationship and rapport. And that was on the forefront of my mind every time I spoke to someone. Now I think now we take things for granted. I'm going to text you, Jay, and I hope you respond in two minutes. Okay. Or I'm going to raise money. I might send you a text saying, hey, I have a great opportunity. I want you to call me. Let's get on a Zoom call. So now I'm on a Zoom call. It's like that face-to-face -face meeting. Right. So the art of the uh, the the meeting and, and the face-to-face -face meeting has kind of fallen by the wayside in this environment. And it's, and it's a shame to me. Uh, so I try to do a lot of these Zoom calls. And COVID wasn't, wasn't helpful either, what went on with that too. So uh, I believe that um, it's a disadvantage if you can't meet with people face-to-face and you're relying on technology to communicate. It's a good way to get instant communication, but it's hard to build that human right. nature. As humans, we want to interact with each other. We want face-to-face. -face. We want to be able to touch each other. We want to be able to have our senses. We want to, we want to understand the other side. It's very challenging, I feel, in this marketplace, in my opinion. I agree with you. can't have that, that in-person interaction with people. Yeah, and those that's are good the insights. Of where our society is right now, I, I agree with everything you said. That's that's some some golden golden insights right there for the listeners. Uh, so Ben, is there anything new that you're working on that you'd like to tell the audience about? And lastly, where can they find you if they want to hear more and, and see you on social media? Um, well, first of all, we just launched a new fund uh, called the Alliance Medical Property Fund. It's a great investment vehicle if you're looking to diversify capital. We still have some room. It will probably sell out shortly. Accredited only? Uh, is this open for anyone? It's accredited investors. Cool. We only deal with right now accredited investors. And tell the audience and, what that means, accredited investor. Well, an accredited investor has a certain status. So basically, I think the rules are uh, you have to make at least 250000 annually in, in income. You need to have a net worth. I believe it's at least a million dollars. And there's all different criteria that you're required to be an accredited investor. So we check our investors, they check documents and boxes with who they are, and we interview every investor. And and so that way, you know, God forbid you have a deal that doesn't go as well, they're not as concerned when they lose money compared right. to someone that invests 5,000 in a multifamily deal that some guy's promoting on Instagram, and they get a little bit, they're a little bit, uh, uh, more agitated because they can't afford to lose that money. That's Talking about difference. Grant Cardone, aren't you? Well, I'm not saying names. I'm just telling. <laughs> I don't like the. There's a lot of people out there that right. do that. It's very common. Reggae, the reggae offerings, yeah. and I think if you are a reggae investor, let's say you're in your 20s, you put five or ten grand 
just know there's a chance you could lose that. And I hope these folks are, are telling people that, that the train could be coming. You have to tell your investors the risks. I am a big proponent, and so is my staff and my company, our foundation, our core values, our transparency, integrity, consistency, and expertise. You do not last in this business if you don't adhere to those values. You have to be transparent. You have to tell people the good and the bad news, integrity. Not every deal, Jay, is going to be perfect. There is no one in the universe that walks on water. You know, I say to my investors, if I go nine for 10 or eight for 10 batting average in my career, that's phenomenal over right. decades right. of work. And that's what it's about. And so, uh, for so accredited that's investors, we where can accred how can accredited investors get involved in the fund? Well, accredited investors, the best way is to go to our website. If they go to uh, Alliance, CGC, and that's charliegeorgecharlie.com. They can find out more about, about our fund. Uh, they can reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. They also can direct, uh, direct message me on at the real Ben Reinberg on Instagram. I'm all over social media. I'm on TikTok. The other way to learn about me personally is to go to benreinberg.com. That's my personal brand. Uh, Jay, you wouldn't believe this, but I got on social media. I'm not talking about LinkedIn because LinkedIn, I was at the start. Because and you that's said TikTok. I'm like, let's yeah. go see you dance. Oh, I'm, I'm on. Oh, no, I don't need to dance. It's just all education videos yeah. I produce. But it's, you know, we have a whole staff, a media company that does that for me. But we're on YouTube with shorts. I have a podcast that we launched in May that's doing extremely well. It's called Ben Reinberg. I own it. It's owning every aspect and being responsible for every uh, variable in your life. So we have guests from all over uh, the spectrum, whether it's health, business, personal development, uh, all, all types of guests from all over that have been on it. And we're growing. We're fully booked through March right now. Cool. So I'm really excited about that. I'm having fun. We have a studio in Laguna Beach that we shoot it from. And uh, that's how to find me. It's pretty easy. I'm pretty out there. In the past, I was not out there because I was known in commercial real estate spaces in our business, but also I was on LinkedIn, and now I'm on the other social media platforms. So we're growing it. Uh, you can follow me. You go to benreinberg.com. You go to alliancecgc.com, and you will be able to find me. And if you're a credit investor and you're interested in investing in fund, just direct message me. I will walk you right into the door in our investor relations department. They'll educate you on exactly what the fund is, the benefits, how it works, and what the process is to, to invest in it. Cool. Ben, this, this has been a blast. I wish I met you six to 12 months ago before we started our closing on our deal. Probably would have saved a lot of headache. But hey, it won't be our last. And I'm glad to have you uh, as part of the network. And if you're listening to this and you liked what you heard, go watch Ben dance on TikTok. It's really going to be <laughs> some funny stuff. I'm just kidding. But yeah. definitely check out the social medias. I follow you on Instagram now, and it, there, there's some some good educational stuff on there. Uh, yes, the other thing is we're going to be teaching commercial real estate. That's my next life. So if you don't know anything about it or you know a little bit about it and you want to learn, uh, we'll be developing some products for you to learn, and I'll be teaching you and mentoring folks in the commercial real estate so you can make sure you mitigate risk and you can learn how to buy a commercial piece of real estate from A to Z. I'll show you how to do that as well. Sign me up. All right, brother. Okay. Ben, this has been a blast, and I'll see you in the next yep. one. All right.